I'm Donna Anderson, author of lovefraud.com, and tonight I'll tell you about my groundbreaking new book. So if you know someone who is over 50 and is making your life miserable, Senior Sociopaths will help you to understand what is going on and decide what to do about it. As always, I'll answer your questions at the end of this short presentation. So to join the chat or ask a question, please be sure to subscribe to this channel. So I've been working on the Senior Sociopaths book for several years. And I started it because of the disconnect that I found between my own personal experience with a sociopath and what I read in other books and scientific articles. For those of you who may not know my personal story, I married a con man, James Montgomery. This guy took $227,000 from me. He cheated with at least six different women in our two and a half year relationship. He had a child with one of the women and then 10 days after I left him, he married the mother of the child, which was the second time he committed bigamy. Now, I was 40 years old when I met him online. He told me he was 49. Then he confessed that he wasn't really 49, he was 51. Then I found out after he had proposed marriage and I said yes, that he lied again. He was actually 55. So the entire time that James Montgomery was scamming me and multiple other women, he was between the ages of 55 and 58. After I left him, I was complaining about his unbelievable behavior to my therapist and she suggested that he might be a sociopath. I didn't know what that meant, so I started researching. And yes, he matched the descriptions precisely. But you can imagine my surprise and confusion when I kept coming across mental health professionals and psychology researchers who said that sociopaths started burning out in their 40s and stopped their antisocial behavior. Well, Montgomery was 55 when he started working on me. I found evidence of the many women he swindled before me when he was in his 30s and 40s and the women he continued to swindle after me when he was well into his 60s. My ex-husband certainly did not burn out. He kept getting worse. I also launched Love Fraud in 2005 and was hearing all kinds of stories from many, many readers, both women and men, who found themselves entangled with abusers, liars, and con artists who were also aged 40 or older. These people were not burning out. So what in the world were psychology experts talking about? I wanted to gather data, so I posted a survey on love fraud, asking readers to describe their experiences with people whom they believed were sociopaths and were age 50 or older. 2,190 readers filled out the survey, and the stories they told were shocking. There were tales of unbelievable deception, manipulation, exploitation, and abuse. The respondents wrote about double lives, criminal behavior, child abuse, and downright cruelty, all perpetrated by supposedly mature individuals. Most of the survey respondents were women who described their spouses or romantic partners, but I also heard from people who wrote about their parents, siblings, family members, in-laws, friends, neighbors, bosses, and coworkers. One thing that most of the survey respondents had in common is that they were traumatized by the experience, no matter what type of a relationship that it was. Almost everyone reported experiencing anxiety, depression, or post-traumatic stress disorder. Many of the survey respondents said that the involvement with the senior sociopath made them ill. And about a third of respondents 
considered or attempted suicide, all because of the actions that sociopaths took while they were over the age of 50. So why in the world were so-called experts saying that antisocial behavior burned out? Well, I get into that in the book. Essentially, researchers have known for a couple hundred years that criminal behavior, as measured by arrests and convictions, peaks when people are in their early 20s, and then it drops off. This is true. But from this fact, experts have drawn the conclusion that because criminal arrests drop off, antisocial behavior also drops off. But there are multiple problems with this conclusion. First of all, arrests and convictions are not the only indicator of antisocial behavior. Secondly, older people are more likely to get away with their crimes. Research shows that cops and prosecutors, even store security guards, don't want to go after grandma or grandpa. And finally, multiple psychology researchers acknowledge that typical evaluation methods may not be gathering accurate data on older populations. So you may ask, how do I know that the people described in my study are actually sociopaths? Well, the survey asked people to rate the individual they were describing according to the draft criteria for antisocial personality disorder slash psychopathy that was put together for the DSM-5. And that's the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of the American Psychiatric Association. It's the Bible for mental health professionals. The rating system was pretty straightforward. There's a list of nine traits, which are deceitfulness, callousness, manipulativeness, hostility, narcissism, irresponsibility, impulsivity, and recklessness. Survey respondents indicated whether each trait described the individual extremely well, moderately well, a little bit, or not at all. Well, usually the survey respondents said that the traits were highly descriptive of the person they were writing about. I was able to validate the data even further. I am a member of the Society of the Scientific Study of Psychopathy, and that's an organization of all the top university researchers in psychopathy. I've presented data at several of their conferences. So I asked one of my colleagues, Dr. Martin Selbaum of the University of Otago in New Zealand to analyze my data. He and one of his doctoral students did and found that yes, most of the people in the survey scored over the cut score for antisocial personality disorder psychopathy. We actually wrote a scientific paper on the data, which was accepted for publication by the International Journal of Offender Therapy and Comparative Criminology. Yeah, that's a mouthful. Um, but anyway, our scientific paper will be published sometime soon. So my book contains real evidence that sociopaths do not burn out. Instead, they continue their abusive behavior until the day they die. So, if you have a senior sociopath in your book, in, in your life, what do you do? I address that in the last two chapters of my book. Chapter 8 is entitled, Dealing with the Senior Sociopath. And survey respondents revealed how they escaped if they could, or how they coped if they couldn't. And chapter nine is about recovery from the senior sociopath. Survey respondents offered their advice, and it can be summarized into three general approaches. First of all, educate yourself about what sociopaths are. Secondly, figure out what made you vulnerable to sociopaths. And third, commit to working on your own recovery. There's a link for more information in the description below. I hope that you'll buy it, and I hope that you'll help me out by writing a review, especially on Amazon. So, let's see, um, looks like we have a few questions to get started. I'll take a look. Okay, so Natalie 
asks, um, what is some of the advice on dealing with toxic and narcissistic older parents? I don't need to have contact with my mother. Is there any reason to when she is so cruel and manipulative? The main thing that people who discussed their um, disordered parents or other people had had observations about how parents, uh, sociopathic parents treated their children, no, you don't have to have contact. Essentially, you know, sociopathic parents never did right by you. And, and, and this is really difficult because, you know, everybody wants to believe that their mother and father loves them. Everybody wants to believe that their, um, you know, parents want what's best for them. And unfortunately, when your parent is a sociopath, that's not true. The other thing that happens is that, you know, especially when you're young, that, you know, the, the parents are, are so manipulative that essentially you learn as a survival tactic to be a people pleaser and to be very conscious of their moods and to, you know, be ready to, you know, do whatever it is to, to keep keep it so that they don't turn their wrath onto you, which is not the way childhood is supposed to be. So quite a few people really suffer from that. So the objective is to understand that it wasn't your fault, that it was your parents, your disordered parents, who didn't do what they were supposed to do. I mean, one of the readers um, who described his mother made the point that the fact that the parent didn't love you is their failing, not your failing. And that can be a hard lesson, you know, because, you know, so many people who are in this situation grow up thinking that there's something wrong with them, and that's why their parent is treating them like that. So the main thing is to really internalize the idea that you're fine, and it was your parent who was disordered, and it was your parent who was not doing what he or she should have been doing, and it was your parent who was not loving you the way he or she should have. So as they get older and more crotchety and more mean and continue to be cruel, you don't owe them anything. So staying away from them is fine. Um, quite a few people talked about how they arranged care for their parents, uh, you know, when they got older. And one woman said that, you know, she liquidated her mother's estate and got her into a 24-hour care home and, you know, and essentially, you know, ignores her for weeks at a time. Uh, I mean, she's being cared for, but she's not doing it herself. So that's probably the main thing when it comes to parents is that, you know, we're taught that we're supposed to honor our mother and father, but only if they're honorable. And sociopathic parents are not honorable. Okay. All right, so it says, Susie asks, will they be scamming when they're nursing homes as they get older? Well, they certainly do scam when they're in retirement homes. In fact, um, I have several stories about that um, because one of the things that um, I did in this book is that I, I quoted lots and lots of people, you know, what they said about their experiences. Some of the quotes are pretty extensive, and I have one long story about um, a family who had to deal with the fact that, you know, her their father was in a nursing home. Actually, the, both their parents had been in assisted living, I think would be a better term. And um, the wife died and the father was alone. And this woman just latched onto him almost immediately and, and really started making it so that she was isolating him. I mean, you know, the guy's 82 and she's 78 and she's doing the same thing that 
that many of us have experienced with, you know, if we if we met someone in our 30s, 40s, or 50s. So yeah, they they absolutely do cause problems in uh, retirement communities. Um, I've actually heard this from other people as well that um, they can be vicious. You know, the cattiness of, of what goes on in some of these situations. So so that's definitely something to be aware of. Okay, so Video Vault says, generally speaking, what makes someone susceptible to a senior sociopath more similar or different from vulnerability to sociopaths of other ages? Actually, it's all pretty much the same. And that's, that's the information, is that the senior sociopaths don't stop. They, they just keep doing what they have been doing all their lives. Um, if, if it's a, the a situation where we're talking about romantic involvements, you know, they just switch their tactics to a new age bracket. And plus, the other thing that happens is that um, they get better at it. You know, I mean, they learn. They learn over the course of their lifetime so that uh, often as, as they get older, you know, they, they can get better at it. Um, they know what works. They know what doesn't work. And, and they will get better at it for a while until the time comes where they don't even try anymore. And then sometimes they just become cruel for the fun of it. So it, it's, it's pretty amazing stuff, pretty amazing material that I have in this book. Um, but yeah, you know, people who are, you know, get targeted for all the same reasons that you get targeted your entire life. Okay, Shana says um, her ex-husband is 62. You have a 14-year-old son, and he lied about his age as well. He just gets worse. Yeah, I, I think you'll find a lot of helpful information uh, in the book. Okay, so healing awakening is asking which college degrees and licenses do I have? Um, I actually went to school for journalism, which has, I mean, that's my main career. Uh, I do have a degree in psychology. Uh, I am not a licensed therapist. Um, but I would say that f for this particular field of sociopaths, I mean, you know, you learn about things the hard way, and I learned the hard way, and I learned through everybody else who has shared their experiences with me. And I can also say that the res another research project that I worked on with some of my colleagues, um, we did a research project on therapy satisfaction because one of the things that I hear all the time is that people are involved with sociopaths, they go to therapy, and the counselor has no idea what they're talking about or, or really does not understand what goes on in an, uh, an involvement with one of these people. And so we asked those questions. We asked people to describe what they experienced in therapy. And essentially, half of therapists really do not understand what happens when you're involved with a senior sociopath or any sociopath. You know, does, that's not limited to senior sociopaths. Uh, they really do not understand what disordered people are like in close relationships. And the therapists who do understand typically found out because they experienced it themselves. You know, it, it's, it's a very hard thing to teach. Well, actually, they haven't been teaching it, you know, for many years. Like there, there, there are now, finally, it's some people in some of these um, graduate programs, they are starting to teach more about what's going on. Um, but, you know, I guess all of us know that you know, until you experience this for yourself, you really can't picture what it is. And, and it's really kind of hard to comprehend, which is one of the reasons why we get into these situations is because we don't understand what's going on. Um, but anyway, I hope that answers your question. So, oh, 
Uh oh, what? So Marsha asks, why do sociopaths want people to chase them? Um, I don't know if I would say that that's a real, um, something that happens all the time. I mean, certainly there are some disordered people who will do that and, and try and get people to chase them. But th that's, that's not something that I would describe as typical or that happens all the time. Um, because the thing about sociopaths is one of the behaviors that they engage in is called hyperfocus. And what that means is that when they like have something on their mind or they latch on to something or, or they, you know, have this idea of what they want to do, they like go at it full bore, you know, hyper focus. They, they focus on it to the exclusion of lots of other things. So if it's a romantic relationship and you're the subject of the hyper focus, that means they're, you know, they're all over you. They're love bombing you. They're, you know, trying to see you all the time and everything like that, you know, which can feel pretty, um, <clears throat> It can feel great. Um, so that so that's a typical behavior. I've certainly heard of uh, situations with uh, with the chasing. Now this this might be what you're referring to. Um, sociopaths engage in intermittent reinforcement, and what that means is that sometimes when you do something, you'll get rewarded for it, and sometimes you don't. <laughs> and that has the effect of keeping you more invested in the relationship. Now, I don't know if the sociopaths understand the, um, the, the science behind that, but they kind of know that it works, so they like pulling strings. Okay, so how do you tell whether the mother is narcissistic or damaged by their childhood trauma? People tried to get help for her earlier on, but she claimed there was nothing wrong with her. Well, that's a sign. Um, one of the typical perspectives, I guess you could say, of people who are either antisocial, narcissistic, or psychopathic is that they think nothing's wrong with them. Um, it's pretty hard to separate personality disorder from childhood trauma because they often go hand in hand. And the reason for that is that um, if someone has a personality disorder, usually one of the parents is disordered, not always, but usually. And as I said earlier, sociopaths make terrible parents. So consequently, you can get the genetic predisposition for the disorder, then plus you get this terrible parenting, which could end up being trauma. Um, so it's a mess, but it's also possible that, um, stories of childhood trauma are exaggerated, you know, unless you know for sure that it happened. Um, but anyhow, it is kind of hard to pull them apart. The main thing is that if someone is suffering from trauma and is not disordered, they feel bad. They, they want to feel better. They, they want treatment. They, they want their life to be different. Whereas someone who's disordered, most of the time they're pretty content with how they are. So if, if this woman doesn't think anything's wrong with her, I would say that that's a, a pretty good red flag. <clears throat> so VDO Vault says, I assume sociopathic and disordered people lie about their ages, most, mostly due to vanity. Uh, well, yeah, that's part of it. And the other part is that they want to make themselves more appealing to whatever target they're going after. Now, in my case, for example, since I was 40, at that time, I was not interested in someone who was like over 50. In fact, I remember when, you know, his, his ad said, my ex-husband's ad said he was 49. I was like, 49, ooh. I don't know. I don't know. But he sounded interesting. And um, so I, you know, checked him out. Had he told his true age, there's no way I would have responded. Um, but he lied anyway. So 
in his case, it was to make himself more appealing, you know, for potential targets. Okay, so Pretty Lady says, I think by burnout, they mean they cause less damage physically. Um, a 50-year-old sociopath cannot leave a fight unscathed the way a 20-year-old can. Um, actually, that's not quite the way some of the psychiatry textbooks put it. Um, I mean, this is actually is in psych several, two or three psychology textbooks that I saw where they say that um, starting at age 40, that they burn out. And, and the way they describe that was that um, they engage in less antisocial behavior. Well, fighting is not the only antisocial behavior. I mean, physical fighting. There's all kinds of things that are antisocial behavior. And one guy actually said they become amusing raconteurs, you know, storytellers, or they become hypochondriacs. I mean, I mean that's, that's what was in a psychiat psychiatry textbook, which amazed me. So, um, like I said, mostly it was misinterpreting, in my opinion, mostly it was misinterpreting the crime data is, is why um, they came up with this conclusion. But I discuss that in detail in the book. So VDO Vault says, um, in my experience, older sociopaths are less physically vigorous and violent, but that makes them more dangerous mentally, psychologically, and emotionally. And I can say that absolutely. Several people who I quote in the book talk about that. How, I mean, I remember one particular story, a guy writing about his father who said that he just became more and more cruel because it was the only thing he could do anymore. So, um, yeah, that, that absolutely is something that a lot of people talked about. Right, so Video Vault, well, you got a lot of contributions here today. Uh, you know, makes the point that a white lie about age isn't necessarily a total, um, doesn't mean you're a sociopath. But yes, you are true. Uh, there are, you are correct. There are plenty of people who lie about their age, especially if they've got online dating ads or something like that. So that's just one component. And there is a whole um, group of symptoms that indicates that somebody could be disordered. And, and I talk about that in my other book or one of my other books called Red Flags of Love Fraud, 10 Signs You're Dating a Sociopath. So that, that book goes into, you know, all the different behaviors that people engage in um, that are warning signs that the person may be disordered. <clears throat> Okay. All right. It feel, looks like that's, um, that's all the questions that we have for today. Um, I'll also be on TV on December 16th. So uh, maybe I'll be talking about that next week. Anyway, I will see you next week, next Tuesday, 8 p.m. Eastern Time for the next episode of Love Fraud Live. Thanks a lot, everybody. Good night.